This video is brought to you by Squarespace. My favourite social media platform is Instagram. As of right now, I have posted over 6,800 photos and videos, mostly photos. Now, when it comes to the ones which resonate with an audience, you know, I know really what is going to connect. I know my cat photos aren't going to connect with everybody, even though they should. And that's why the cats have their own accounts. The gear photos do very well. And the pretty photographs, the ones which are really just about lovely images that I, I want to share, can do really well. I've only had a couple of photographs and videos which have gone over 10,000 likes. And the one that's had the most is this one. Easily the least creative post I've ever put on Instagram. It's not a photo, it's not a video. It's a simple graphic of a pie chart. The amount of time that we spend in post-production when it comes to editing and when it comes to trying to find the perfect music. And that's what this video is about. It's the quest and the amount of time that we lose in our lives just trying to find that perfect track. Music will make or break your piece. It's about connecting that emotion, not overwhelming it, not the music itself creating that emotion, oh. <laughs> Hi. but the combination of the music and the images to complement each other. You're not making a music video after all. It's not the main feature of the video. You are using that music to enhance the emotion that you're trying to create. And if it isn't working, it could be because the music is wrong, or it could be your images just don't work, or it could be the edit, or it could be all of them together. Very frequently, it is the music. Not everything should have music over it though. These examples I've just shown you do, but music shouldn't just be used as a blanket thing. It should be used when appropriate. Using natural sound, real sound, has huge power. And you mustn't forget that. Don't always just chuck music over something. But mostly it should be a combination of your A sound, your natural sound, and music when appropriate. Fascinating. What's that? It's dice. Sure? Yeah, yeah. It's not like something in there. Okay. just beautiful. When I was working for Sky News, it was really easy to choose music because they had an arrangement with the big music publishers. So apart from, I think, the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and some film soundtracks, I could use anything I wanted. I just need to fill out a music return 
and the music library would do all that paperwork. I would just grab the track and use it. It was a joy. And if you work for the BBC, you can use anything you want, which was amazing. And when I was making those documentaries and long form edits for Sky and being able to choose my own music, it was a joy because I have such a, a really good knowledge of all sorts of music, a huge love of it. So it really wasn't much of a struggle finding the right track. It was actually pretty easy. It was when I went freelance in 2006, and the first series that I worked on was for Channel 4, for a production company, it was a documentary series. And they didn't have any arrangements with any publishers. So they had to work to a very small budget. I think it was like 150 pounds for each 23 minute episode, which is absolutely nothing. And the quality of the music they got, it was okay. It wasn't great at all. And it made me think of what I'm going to do when I had to do my own videos in my first corporates, which I hadn't done at that point. I'd just been doing broadcast TV. What music was I going to use? Little did I realize just how much of my life was gonna be consumed with looking for the right music and music that I could actually afford and use legally. If you've been following me since I started on YouTube back in 2007 or so, you'll know that some of my early personal stuff was using music which wasn't licensed and it was naughty. And so, you know, the way that YouTube will deal with that is they will sometimes block it in certain countries, but most likely you just simply won't be monetized. But you can't do that when you're making something which is corporate, which is for a client, and if you do want to earn any money from YouTube, it does need to be licensed. And being licensed isn't just putting in the description where the music is from. Most likely you're going to have to pay for it. Whether you pay for a royalty free license where you can just use it as much as you want or a per project license for specific uses for a specific project, you just have to pay. There are some free things out there, Creative Commons stuff, and some of them are pretty good. You just need to make sure that you do credit them in the description or in the video. But finding good stuff was a huge challenge in those early days, a huge challenge. A little trick that I used that sometimes worked and sometimes didn't, if I wanted to use a particular piece of music that I knew was out of the budget for the client, was this. I would do my first rough edit to the track that I wanted to use. And most of the times the client really loved it. But I did tell them, this isn't the music track that will be in the final video because it's out of your budget. I'll send you a, another version soon with the track that you know we can afford, which would be awful. And sometimes they managed to find the money to get the track that was so much better because they heard that first rather than they heard the not so great piece of music first which if you've done it the other way around wouldn't have worked these days we are so spoilt with the amount of subscription-based music services that we can use there's so many fantastic ones out there i mean i've been using music bed for a long time now and there's Artlist and Epidemic Sounds, and they're all fantastic, got loads of great tracks on there. Some are better for certain types of music, for sure. You just need to be very careful about the license and how you can use it. You know, all of these will be fine for just your YouTube videos, but do check if you're gonna do any corporates and videos that go on other people's channels, whether your subscription will cover it or not, because it may well not. To give an example of just how much music can cost you depending on how it's used, a good example is a video I made a few years ago for Sony called The Woodcarver to promote the Sony FS5. And there's a couple of tracks in it which were perfect for what I wanted. The thing is, because it wasn't just for my own personal use and it was for a paid job for Sony, the way that this company measures the cost of a license is actually based upon the size of the company it's for, the amount of employees, etc. And it was going to work out for these two tracks for a, you know, a continuing license, you know, doesn't expire for global because it's the internet. It was going to be like $15,000 for the two tracks, which was crazy. I did manage to get a nice deal because I had a good relationship with the company, but it was just 
terrifying because I knew that if I wanted to use these tracks, there was no way that Sony would pay for them, understandably, because it's really expensive. I think I'm pretty good at knowing what I need. It's finding that track is the hard bit. Trying to translate what's in your brain to what you need to search for can be incredibly time consuming. So when I am searching, I do make sure that if I hear a track that I like, I save it within that service in a folder or a favorite for future use, something that I can flag. Not right for this project, but something that I like and could use for something else. Because otherwise, if you just ignore it, you say, yeah, I like that, I may use that another time, you'll probably never find it again. So it's something that's really worth doing. I came across Audio Network in late 2016 when they contacted me about a film competition slash workshop they wanted me to be part of. They invited me down to Abbey Road Studios to hear a recording of one of their tracks. And had a 25 piece orchestra in there and Luke Richards was the composer and it was magnificent. It was proper movie scoring. That sort of quality and that sort of type of music I just could not find to license anywhere. I asked them how much it would cost to license this music to use it on YouTube. And I can't remember exactly the prices back then. I do know what they are now, and so I'm gonna go with that. Um, if you just wanted to use the music for personal use on YouTube without monetization, I think it's about 11 pounds. If you want to use monetization, it's 20 pounds a track which is for what it is is amazing but it is per project single use you can't use it again for commercial use i think it's 69 pounds which isn't actually that bad this doesn't cover broadcast you know or netflix type stuff the streaming services back then they didn't have any subscription service you could get a contract which would let you use the entire library for all your productions but very expensive, it's thousands. But if you're a production company and you're making all these different videos, it would actually kind of make sense. And I was lucky enough because I was working with them on this project that they gave me the contract for free. And it was amazing. And the first project I used it with was for Western Digital. It was a sponsored video on YouTube and just finding the tracks, I bet. Finding the tracks was really easy. Finding the right tracks was just, it was, there were so many things I wanted to use and I couldn't squeeze them all into this video. It was wonderful. I think I used maybe six tracks or so. So you know, it wouldn't have been that expensive had I had to actually charge the client licensing them individually. Following on from that project, I use it for my YouTube videos, for monetization, uh, which would have cost me 20 pounds had I not had that contract. And 20 pounds for a really quality piece of music actually isn't that bad at all. If you're gonna use a lot of tracks though, it can really add up and that's where you could be put off having that sort of system rather than getting a subscription system. And if you had say six tracks in your video, then that's gonna cost you, you know, six times 20 pounds, which is, £120, which, you know, may not be worth it for you because, you know, YouTube monetization doesn't bring in that much money unless you have a lot of subscribers. So, thankfully, they have a subscription system now called the Essential Edit. It is definitely more expensive than the others. It's, uh, it's about £100 a month, but it gives you a huge amount of choice of music. It's not their entire library, but it is, it's tens of thousands of tracks. All the tracks that I've ever used have been from that. And you can use it for all your corporate work as well as your YouTube videos. 
and just having this massive library at the touch of your fingertips is just an absolute joy. So what I'm gonna do right now is go through some of my favorite pieces on YouTube and show you the music that I use, how I found it, why I chose that, and the struggles that I had, even, you know, still with this huge library, it still can be hard. But the more you use it, the more you know what to look for. You get favorite composers, and you know the type of genres and things that you need. Just before that, here's a quick message from the sponsor of this video, Squarespace. I've had a website since going freelance in 2006. It then became a blog the following year, but it got so big that the part where people could find out how to actually hire me was lost. That's when it got redesigned and split up into two sections. The new work part of my site, the part where people can find out how to actually hire me, was created using Squarespace and one of their fantastic templates. Perfect for people who cannot code for toffee, like me. You can get 10% off your own website or domain via the link in the description. I think it kind of makes sense to start with my most recent edit, which is Distance, which was made for Zcam and Atomus to show off the E2 working with ProRes RAW. So there's quite a lot of shots here. Uh, there's a number of ways you can build up your edit. You can go through each one and then just clip things up. You can select them all and dump them onto a timeline and you have them all there. When it came to selecting the music though, for this, I actually really struggled on this one because I wanted it to have a relaxing, pastoral, countryside, feeling to it but something a bit more than that and when you are looking for music you don't want it to be the same thing just bland all the way through and also I do like something which does have you know, note changes music changes beat changes you know whether it's percussion or something the ability to give me an edit point a cut on a sound which sounds much cleaner if it's all just one flowing like strings type thing it's actually really hard to edit I tried a piece of music and it was called Free Falling. Now here is the track here. You get a lot of information. Look, this was a 28 piece string session from Studio 2. See all of these things here is very interesting. So one of the huge benefits of Audio Network is you don't just get one version of the track. So some places like Musicbed will have an instrumental and a vocal version of tracks, which is very, very useful. But I very rarely will use a vocal track on my edits because I feel it overwhelms something and it does feel much more like a music video if you've got vocals on it. You know, it can work. But what we have here is the main mix, which we can play a bit of here. And so we have a nice gentle start to it, it's a nice bit of piano. Lovely. And then it sort of picks up about 30 seconds in. Look at the length of it, 302. So not a bad length. And it gets nice here. We've got some lovely strings that come in here. Now we could look at different versions here. So we have one with tuned percussion. Try and see what this one sounds like. Look at the waveforms if it changes. So this is a lot more even. So what we don't have is the strings, which could work to a point, but I, it wouldn't carry the whole piece because it doesn't have those emotional builds. It's all very one note. It works much more as an underscore. So let me just play you the edit using free fall to start with. This was not the first track I chose either. I had quite a lot of tracks. This is not a finished grade. This is just an assembly to the music. You can see the change of the shots on the notes. And it works, it's quite nice. And it means also the shots aren't actually that long, which is good because what you don't want to do is have the shots last too long. So six seconds, three seconds. 
but I am being governed by the music a little bit here on the length of my shots. See, I feel this shot is quite a big, strong difference from the, the woman sitting down to the, all the people. I feel there should be a stronger note on that, potentially. But let's have a look at what happens when we get to the strings. That worked perfectly. We have a lovely change from the stuff on the hill, and we have the guy running down. His guy went back and forwards loads. I struggled after this. It just didn't feel right for me. It, it didn't have the right emotional build at the right time. So the piece that I actually went with was from Luke Richards, who was the guy at Abbey Road Studios when I first went there. And it's Secret Beauty. And Secret Beauty is a track that I've used a number of times in bits and pieces, but never as a whole edit. And you can see it has quite a lot of different moments. Lovely change here with some folk violin, which creates an emotion on itself. Although this was a very familiar piece to me, after struggling for most of the day trying to find other things, I ended up going with this. Another part of music signifies a change, which is really important. The shot to the field, to the cows, it's a different instrument, and it works really well. Helps with the sound of the cows too. The next change is where we go to the folk violin. So it's from the field of the cows, and we're going to the river, and that's where the folk violin kicks in. which I felt was just spot on, worked really well for this. The next change was where that music picked up, that speed change, and I wanted that because that's when we have all these people. And my little device here is, the goose is you, is me. He is watching the world go by, he's seeing people, and he's like, wow. Look at all those people over there. Well, we get the change in music and the speed change. Which just works perfectly for me. So that is my first edit I just wanted to show you. And the whole thing hinged on that piece of music. Without that piece of music, the edit didn't work for me. I was struggling. And using a piece of music that I already knew, it worked really well. I'm just going to quickly show you the interface and how to find music on Audio Network. You've got musical styles, your mood and emotion, instrumentation, and what I often click is orchestral, of course, for some of that stuff, and different production genres here. And then you have some additional filters where you can specify the length and the tempo. It's incredibly simple. Let's find something that is very different to my usual stuff. We'll go with some rock. We'll go with hmm, power and energy. Instrumentation, electric guitar. Well, obviously. <laughs> I 
I want it to be faster than that. So let's go for very fast. Perfect. So I should have used this for distance. Next time, I'll save it in my folder. When I do my longer reviews, I do use a lot of music. You may get the impression that it is just the orchestral stuff that I really like, which isn't true at all. I love having the ability to use all sorts of different genres and stuff. This is the Gian Weeble S review from September last year. And this also has lots of different types of stuff. It has orchestral, it has jazz, it has disco, it has all sorts of fun different stuff that work for particular sequences. If you look at this section here and take note of when the shots change on the moments of the music, whether it is a beat or uh, a note change, On the Order Network page, here's Double Jeopardy. There's actually 28 versions that they've done. The one minute version I used was number seven. But we also have much shorter versions and then we have some stings and bumpers which we could use. Now, if you are using the license per track, each of these different versions counts as a new track. If you're using the essential edit or you have the contract with them, it's all included. The best bit is the opening section with Lollipop, my cat Lollipop. And I use a track, two tracks here. I use Replica One, which we'll hear in a second, and one piece called Tommy's Tango, which has actually become Lollipop's theme. So whenever she pops up in videos, I use this. Absolutely great to edit with, matches the visuals perfectly. You don't want to have a nice orchestral track on this. This is what you want. And then we change. In this edit, The Castle in the Snow from last year, I really wanted to get a feel of Game of Thrones. I wanted to have something that sounded a little bit like it was from that show. And one of the instruments that would be key to that is the cello, which I think really works well here. I think this really has a great Game of Thrones feel to it. Telescope is an interesting one because it uses two pieces of music from the same composer, Christopher Slasky, who I have used a number of times because I just love his music a lot. The reason why we have two different pieces is there's two distinct locations here. There's the first part, which is here. And this is one of my favorite places in the whole of the world. This is King Henry's Mound in Richmond Park. 
and there's a telescope here which you can see straight through to St Paul's Cathedral through the gap. Nobody's allowed to build anything between there. I think it's like nine miles or something like that. So we have this nice gentle piece from Christopher to start with and you're gonna see something come up which I never do. It's one of those transitions that's not really me at all, but it works perfectly for this because really I'm a straight cut kind of guy. Change of pace, change of feel, works really well. We have natural sound throughout this as well. Could I have used one piece for this? Maybe, but the two parts are so completely different. It made total sense to use two different tracks. But by using the same composer, it did have a much more of a flowing, coherent feel than if I'd used two completely different composers for the two tracks. I have a very strong connection to the Greek island of Skiathos ever since going there on holiday a few years ago. And I've become very involved with the charity who look after the stray cats there, the Skiathos Cat Welfare Association. And when I found out in late 2017 they were being evicted from the land, I decided to make a documentary, which ended up becoming four documentaries, to raise awareness for the incredible work they do with looking after the strays in the island and keeping the population down by nutrient and try and raise enough money to buy land on the island yes. and build on it for a permanent home. It's an incredibly expensive island and they needed to raise 150,000 euros. Thankfully, late last year that goal was finally reached. In August last year, I went on holiday there. Sort of on holiday there. I borrowed a Fuji GFX 100 and I decided I was going to do a little bit of filming out there and just make a nice pretty piece. I didn't feel there was anything I could add in the story at that point. I enjoyed using the Fuji GFX 100 so much and the images that I was getting were, were just beautiful and I was well basically filming every day. What was going to be a nice simple little edit, you know a three or four minute thing, it changed. It became something much more much, much more. It is definitely the most personal film I've ever made and it is my favourite thing that I've ever made. It's beautiful, it has an unconventional narrative and structure and it has a very strong emotional core to it. When you start watching it, it feels like one thing. It feels like, isn't this island lovely and beautiful? And then as we go through, it gradually changes. Previous documentaries were full of interviews, actuality. This one was so different. This had no voiceover, no interviews, and probably no more than a couple of dozen words were said in this, if that. Because there was no talking, the music needed to be one of the driving forces of this. More so than anything else I'd made, the music choices in this documentary were absolutely crucial. In the previous four documentaries, a lot of the music was used again and again to create themes which helped to make them feel like a series. I did use 
two or three of the same tracks in here, but most of them were new. The film has distinct chunks throughout it, and these are just short sections from those. I'm only showing you a few of them just to give you a feel of how the music affects the images. I think I've used roughly 12 tracks in here. This is a very organized edit in Premiere, one of my most organized ever. Everything is color coded as you can see. So external audio recording, I main footage, graphics, and the music of course here. And that is green. So we can select the music. This is not just the music that I use. This is all the music that I tried and considered and uh, it's all from audio network and huge mountain and then this folder here is actually <laughs> even more stuff which wasn't specifically selected it's just my main audio network download folder and not just is it nice and organized here it's also organized on the timeline all the music is on track four as you can see This film is essentially the story of two stray cats. I wanted to show that every life matters. I'd already adopted two strays from there the previous year, Harriet and Jimmy the Greek. So obviously my connection with stray cats is huge. If you love animals, you will really connect to this. And if you don't love animals, I implore you to watch it as well, because it might make you see how wonderful they actually are. All I've been doing is setting the mood, introducing you to the characters of the island and one of the stray cats and showing you why this place is important to me. It's supposed to suck you in. I know this is a long video, I'm going through things a fair bit in depth, but this information is here to just show you how music should be used and how it can really help with that emotional connection and how it could really complement everything. Something I said right at the beginning. This is quite an important section here because what I want to do is show you how you can take the same track but use different versions and combine them when one part works and one part doesn't work. The track I'm talking about here is Falling in Air. The main version, version one, is too much, too overwrought for what I would want, in especially in a section where it would go. It's just way too much. But version three is much more of a a bed, an underscore, it's just piano, no strings, much better. There's a section though in, in the first part which is actually really nice though. I actually shortened the first part. You bring in the piece of music that you want into Adobe Audition and then you right click it and you create a new multi-track session and then in properties you click enable remix doesn't take long to do it and then you put in the length of what you want it to be 
there it is and then a new length of the track all he's done is one simple edit there it's a very easy track to do a remix on to be honest with you not everything's going to work and sometimes you do need to change some of the parameters which are beneath the remix tab of course you can also lengthen it as well which i often do for my reviews for when i'm just waffling and waffling and waffling and i can't find a piece of music that's 97 minutes long i will take a three minute track and extend it that might be an exaggeration actually Sometimes you do have to do it manually because it doesn't always get it exactly as you want it to do. But this is a great function in Adobe Audition if you have the software. So let me just go to the section in Shamalipi where I use this track. So this is version 3, which is the underbed, the piano version. And this first version I'm going to put up onto the higher track and play it over the shots. Just disable the underscore version and you can hear how how it's too much you can hear how it just does not fit these images at all so i'm going to play that bit with the underscore and you can see how much better it is with just the piano without the overwrought strings See, it's nice, complements it, much better. Music should match. And this is just a natural sound that I recorded as well, so just you can hear that. Combining both, really important. This is a very difficult part in the, in the film for me. I haven't shown you Rocky or anything about his story in this because it's, it's just too difficult. The section where this music is used goes on for a fair bit after this and the problem with the under bed is it's just too bland to carry the visuals because it's not supposed to be it it's it's a bed it's a it's, it's an underscore it's not supposed to be driving the visuals so i want to use part of the first version so let's go back to how it is in the actual film where i start with the under bed and then go to the second half of the first version, which is a really lovely part of that track. See, it has a nice melody. Cello comes in, the rest of the strings. It is an emotional piece of music at this point. But it needs to be because it is a very emotional point in this film. And there's Rocky. This was a really, really difficult thing. And also filming myself during all of this was, well, it certainly wasn't a holiday. And now there's no music, only sound effects, and no video, only stills. There's another moment within the film where there's a big chunk where there's no music. It didn't need it, it was wrong, it was completely wrong and overly manipulative. After about a three minute section with no music, the most special piece of music to me.
just to let you know that she's fine and she's being looked after and fed. She still lives on the beach, the same beach that Harriet was from. And they visit her every day and feed her as well as the others on the beach. And I really hope to get back there as soon as I can. Hopefully by seeing how I choose my music and the decisions I make and the problems I have has helped you. And I'm hoping that you too will spend a lot less of that pie chart in trying to find your ideal music for your videos. <laughs>